Okay. So now we will look at the interface and reach generalized final element map. So uh, this is a, a particular type of generalized FEM uh, because the enrichment functions that are used are in a way simpler. And uh, the idea is similar. You are, you are augmenting the, the standard final element space by enrichment functions. But we are, you, as you will see soon, you, you, will not, uh, you will no longer enrich the nodes of the background discretization, <clears throat> but we are going to enrich nodes that are placed along the discontinuities. So that is the main difference. And the other difference is that the enrichment functions are kept local by construction, so we construct these enrichment functions in a way that we know they are going to be exactly zero outside the cut elements, right? And, and this has really nice implications. Pretty much uh, everything that we we had lost, uh, the nice properties of standard FEM, uh, by using enrichment functions are, are, are brought back in this approach. So the Kronecker delta property that we had in standard FEM that is lost uh, depending on the types of enrichment functions that you use in GFEM, that is brought back in IGFEM. Okay? Or uh, prescribing directly boundary conditions in, in IGFEM is as straightforward at, as in standard FEM. These, these things are, are really, really nice. So the, the ap approach was uh, uh, first uh, published in a paper by Sohail Sograti, good friend of mine. In 2012, and since then we have been working uh, on this method, and we have been developing the method in in many different directions. Um, but the the idea of the method is that you can in a mesh-independent manner, you can also solve for problems with weak discontinuities. So IGFEM deals with weak discontinuities. Uh, so it would be basically the, the, the simil to the generalized final element method for material interfaces that we saw last, uh, last course. Uh, but it's a, in, a, in a way, in many ways, the IGFEM formulation and the implementation is, is much simpler. So let's, let's understand the method uh, with just a very simple 1D example. So you have here a bar on the right. We have seen this problem already. We know that the solution to that problem is going to have a kink at the location of the discontinuity. So if that is x and this is the function, then the solution should look something like this. Of course, it is assuming that you have different material properties at either side of the interface, otherwise you wouldn't have a kink. So let's say uh, on the left you have E1 and E2 on the right, it being the Young's modules. Yeah? And what we're going to try to do is to solve this problem with only one element. So one final element. So if I discretize my bar, uh, these are going to be the standard nodes, and then I'm going to have, um, let's say, these are going to be my standard shape functions of the partition of unity for this problem, right? You are already all familiar with that. I'm going to call this phi1 and this one phi2. And what I want is to obtain an approximation, so, so my my u function, in this case the, the displacement along the bar, is going to be written as the sum i equals 1 to 2, because I just have two nodes, phi i, which is a function of x, multiplied by ui, plus some enrichment function that I'm going to call uh, like that, multiplied by alpha which is going to be my generalized degree of freedom. So you can immediately see this has a very similar structure to the generalized finite element formula that we saw in the, in the first class. So this portion here is my standard firm component. Yeah, and this part here is my enrichment, where this is my enrichment function. And alpha is my generalized degree of freedom. So you notice 
that I am not longer using the partition of unity to localize the effect of this enrichment. And the main reason for that is that, well, I'm going to construct that enrichment so that it is local to that cat element by construction. Okay? Just going to write that down. Okay. Of course, we know what the material interface gives us, right? We have a C0 field. That means that there is going to be a discontinuity in the gradient of the field. And so this enrichment function somehow has to reflect that appropriate knowledge that we have about the problem so that we can reproduce the exact solution. Okay. Uh, what we do, as, as we just uh, looked at, is to subdivide that big element into integration subdomains for the same reason, we want to do integration in, in, of uh, C infinity functions. So, so we really want to perform integration of smooth functions. And therefore, uh, that big element that has nodes 1 and 2, right, at the location of the discontinuity that I call gamma, is going to be, let's say, split into two subdomains. So let's take this, then it's going to be split in those two elements. And, and we use a very simple idea. We're going to use the Lagrangian shape functions of those integration elements to come up with our enrichment function. Right? So if we take... Um, Let's use another color for this. If we take this function, which is basically the second Lagrangian shake function of that first integration element, and we take this one, which is the first shake function of that second integration element, and we combine those together, then we have a really a function that is zero continuous. So that is the whole idea behind this uh, enrichment function that we use. We take integration elements and we just use the Lagrangian chain functions in those integration elements to build our enrichment function. You have a question? Yeah, what, uh, what are the zero about? C0 means that the function is continuous, mm -hmm. but the derivative is already discontinuous. Yeah? Correct. Yeah? So you can think of this element here, let's call this omega 1, and this is omega 2. What you see here is if this is my node, let's call it again, this is gamma, this function that we have here is phi gamma uh, in element one and this one here is phi gamma in element two so gamma is the location of the node it's, it's basically uh, one two are the node numbers and then gamma would be the third node okay so 
we use Lagrange shape functions in these integration elements to build our enrichment. Yeah, so then basically our enrichment function looks like this. So it's going to be equal to that function, which is actually x minus x1, x gamma minus x1 for x less than x gamma, yeah, and this other function, which is x2 minus x divided by x2 minus x gamma for x greater than x gamma. And because this is a C0 continuous function, those less is less than or equal or greater than or equal. It's the same. The values are going to be the same. Yeah. So now we, we have pretty much everything that we need in place to solve this problem. So we follow the same idea that we have a Galerkin approximation where uh, our, our weight function is also represented in the same way. Okay. And uh, then the only difference with respect to standard FEM is that this function has to be added at the bottom of our array that contains the functions. And the derivative of this function has to be added at the back as well of that B matrix. That's, that's all there is to it, okay? So, the stiffness matrix becomes, as we have done before, K, which for this particular case that we have only one element is actually our global stiffness matrix, right? Uh, is going to be the addition of two integration elements. So we're going to have x1 to x gamma, e1a, um, let's call d phi transpose dx, d phi dx, plus the integral between x gamma and x2 and then I have e2a and the rest remains the same. Yeah? Where my vector of functions is now composed by phi1, phi2, and my enrichment function. And of course we know that uh, phi1, we have done this already in the past, is x2 minus x, then x2 minus x1, phi2, x minus x1, x2 minus x1. These are just linear functions. Look, so far we are expressing everything in terms of global coordinates, but of course in a, in a real implementation of IGFEM we really want to do this transformation as well, but to keep things simple for so that you understand uh, uh, the, the, the rationale be behind this method, then we're expressing everything in global coordinates, so there is no mapping involved here, okay? So the derivatives of this array with respect to x coordinate well, it's going to be minus 1 divided by L. So this element has a length L. So let me mark that down here somewhere. Uh, 
1 divided by L and then 1 divided by lowercase l 1 so that is the length of the first integration element and this is 4 x less than x gamma and uh, something very similar to the ones uh, to the one above for the second element only that the length is of course for the other part for the second integration element and notice that I don't use the equality anymore because indeed the function is discontinuous at that location the derivative that is where I have the jump so if we build the stiffness matrix so if I take for example uh, this first term right and I call this uh, let's call it <coughs> the Stevens matrix contribution due to the first integration element and this let's call it like that so then very simply my function uh, is going to be one well I am assuming that we have One divided by L, one divided by L one. And this is symmetric. So here I am assuming that on the left I have a Young's modulus of one. Yeah. So if you do the numbers it's going to be something like this zero point five minus zero point five minus 1 it's going to look something like that something similar we obtain for the second integration element but for the second integration element we're going to uh, assume that there is a Young's modulus of 10 okay And then we have to change some values here, L2, and this is L2 here. And some of you will expect to have that same thing as you saw above, but 10 times. So it's 5 minus 5, minus 5, 10, 20, and it's symmetric here. So that is our second Stevens matrix. Yeah, so our global Stevens matrix, which is basically just adding the contribution of these two, That's it. Very straightforward. Well, now that we have that, uh, what is the force vector? Who can tell me what is the force vector for this problem? So we have three degrees of freedom. So our force vector is going to be size three by one. So what is the value on the left? U to one. Mm. 
So on the left we have the reaction, right? The first node is going to have the reaction because it's uh, it's fixed. Then the second node, which is on the right, is going to have a value of on the right. I'm sorry, P. P. Let's uh, let's assume that is uh, that is equal to one. So we have uh, the reaction first element. The second element is equal to one, and then the last element, which is corresponding to the additional degree of freedom alpha. Zero. Yep. Very straightforward. So my F is going to be my reaction force one and zero. And now while we have our global Siemens matrix on our global force vector, we can uh, basically we can solve the system, right? So what we do, well, we have this matrix. We have our degree of freedom vector that has u1, u2, and alpha. And that is going to be equal to our right-hand side. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. But I will double check that later. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will double check that, but most likely you're right. So, uh, what we have here is we're going to just apply the, the same usual way to solve the system. So, let's, we're going to uh, zero out that column we zero out that row right because we're not interested in that degree of freedom we just uh, add a one in the diagonal and then we set the right hand side equal to zero this is something that you already are all familiar with and then we obtain the solution for that and my degree of freedom vector has values 0 0 0.55 and 0 0.225 yeah, and of course, um, what I'm assuming here is that L is equal to 1, which is the length of the bar. Um, everything is, now my node is positioned, my, my discontinuity is, is positioned at the middle of the, of the element. This is something you can, you can check as well uh, if you're interested in learning about how IGFEM works. The, the problem is uh, simple enough that you can actually check it by hand. L1 is equal to L2 is equal to 0 0.5 and the displacement if you plot the displacement is going to look well let's say this is our first node this is our gamma 2 is going to look something like this yeah so the exact solution, we are able to retrieve the exact solution for this problem, is equal to 0 0.55 times x plus 0 0.225 divided by 0 0.5 times, well, x For x less than or equal to x gamma and 1 minus x for x greater than or equal to x gamma and that's it <coughs> now if you do an interpolation so the displacement can be interpolated with a partition of unity and this is what you get right that is if you just use a partition of unity so basically that alpha extra degree of freedom that I'm adding to the solution that is able to you know, help us in recovering the exact solution for this problem that is linear, that quantity alpha uh, physically represents this distance here. So 
So that is alpha. So in a way, is what you need to add to the displacement that is interpolated by the partition of unity shape functions in order to recover that uh, that solution. Yeah. So let me write that down. Remember P U uh, denotes partition of unity. Yeah. So it is interesting. We just we just came up with a very simple uh, generalized uh, finite element approximation that is able to to recover the exact solution for this problem, right? And, and we use, uh, as we see here, we use the, the Lagrangian functions of integration elements to construct this enrichment. But this enrichment has a big problem, right? The problem is that uh, as you move that material interface to the background nodes, right, the generalized enrichment function, our enrichment approximates more and more and more the original partition of unity shape function. And we, we know uh, we know that, that that is not good, right? So in a way, you can think of as as the, the, the as the material interface is moving towards the mesh nodes um, because of the resemblance of the enrichment function and the background partition of unity. Then we are creating some sort of linear dependency there. Okay, and linear dependency is not good. Why was not good? Why it was not good? Yeah, because you lose what we call stability. So the formulation is not stable. So in order to do uh, to make this formulation stable, in fact, our enrichment function is multiplied by something that uh, so that the the value of the of the enrichment function goes to zero as this discontinuity approaches the nodes of the original mesh, and that's what we do. So there is some scaling there. Okay. So let me see if I can copy this. So let me write another color here. So as I go to the So what we do in order to prevent the, the issue with the condition number, we just scale the function. And in fact, I found, I found out that the most optimal scaling function that you can use, uh, so if we take our enrichment function and we multiply it by a scaling factor s, where s is the square root of 2 
uh, multiply by w1 minus w and w is just the location of the interface relative to the length so w here is x gamma divided by l this is actually an optimal uh, representation of that scaling function that is going to give you the best um, condition number for that matrix so actually you can see here because I represent this uh, W as a relative location of the discontinuity relative to the length that um, uh, W is going to be equal to uh, is going to be in the range 0 to 1 yeah so when you are uh, when you are in the left node W is equal to 0 when you are at the right node W is equal to 1 and you can see that in both cases that the scaling factor is equal to 0 so when you are at the background nodes right then your enrichment function is no longer active okay that is the main message but there is a problem with with this if I if I use that scaling factor right uh, then my alpha which we just attributed a, a physical meaning then is no longer there right that physical meaning that we said well alpha is actually the difference between the value that you can interpolate uh, from the partition of unity shape functions and the actual value of the function well that physical meaning is no longer there because of this scaling factor okay 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 so let's uh let's summarize um, i mean in, when you move to higher dimensions the formulation is very very straightforward very simple and and uh, i want to 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 show you how they look in in higher dimensions and then we're going to close with some nice properties of igfem versus GF, gfem for material interfaces or for problems with weak discontinuities so in higher dimensions uh you would expect to see something similar to what we wrote here on top so we're going to have two terms one term is a standard component another term is the enrichment and it actually looks very similar it's just uh, we know that we are doing an summation over the nodes of the background mesh and now we're going to have a sum over my enrichment functions as well and I can scale them to prevent the issue with the conditioning and now of course my degrees of freedom be it standard or enriched this is the standard DOFs and these are my enriched DOFs. They are all vector based. Yeah? So um, I had an example earlier where I had a discontinuity. Now I'm going to create another discontinuity here. So say um, we have an element. In two dimensions, we're dealing with a triangular element. And uh, let's say that this is being cut by an interface that looks like this. And so this node here is going to be I, this is going to be J. So then my enrichment function is going to look something like this. It's going to be equal to 1 at the location of the node. In fact, not 1, but the value of the scaling factor at that location. And it's going, it's going to go down to 0 linearly in all other nodes. Yeah? This is my... first enrichment function so I'm going to use the same the same color here 
this is i and this is j so let me copy this So for the second node, it's very similar as well. It goes to the value of the scaling parameter at the location of the node, and it goes linearly to zero at all other nodes. Something like that. In fact, it does not really look like that because on the quadrangular side there is an integration element, but I don't want to get into uh, the details on, on why is that. So this is going to be my second enrichment function. Okay. So of course, when you add this up, if you take, for example, uh, and I want to see how. Uh, let's use another color here. How this function looks like, you can immediately see that it's going to be a function that has a, it, it looks like a tent, right? Would you mind closing, please? Two minutes. Okay, we run out of time. Uh, right now I'm using uh, triangular elements all over so the function is going to look like this if I add them up of course we don't add them up but it's just for you to have like a visual representation of, of how this function looks like so it is a zero continuous function along that, uh, let's say, in the, along the discontinuity. OK, we run out of time. Um, next class, after the trip to China, we are going to look at uh, some of the properties of this method. So I'm going to wait until then, because I want to add those to this lecture so that they are you know, part of the, of the whole lecture. Uh, uh, and then, and then, well, then this formulation is for uh, weak uh, discontinuities, so for material interfaces. Then the next thing we're going to look is into the discontinuity in rich finite element method, which extends this approach to strong discontinuities. Okay, thank you, guys.